It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning uh, is to the Premier. Um, I think it's pretty positive that uh, Ontario is finally joining the rest of the world and uh, receiving vaccinations. Uh, that's a positive thing, but questions still remain uh, about the, uh, you know, the fair uh, inoculation uh, process, whether the inoculation process here in our province is actually going to be uh, you know, done fairly. Uh, and I, I asked the question this morning because I think there are still lots of questions that are uh, that are you know swirling out there uh, in uh, in Ontario uh, about uh, how this government intends or, or whether this government has a plan uh, to actually make sure that those folks who need the vaccines the most are in fact going to get them first as opposed to folks who are going to decide to queue jump to reply the Minister of Health Thank you. Well, I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. There is a plan that has been developed that was based on the work of bioethicists. We did receive uh, uh, recommendations from them. The plan that has been developed is based on uh, age and risk and making sure that our most vulnerable receive the vaccines first, which is why we have vaccinated the people who want to receive them in long-term care homes, and 80 per cent of them have also received their, uh, their second vaccine. So we are well on our way to implementing our plan uh, based on the uh, plan that was developed with the assistance of the Vaccine Task Force based on the work of the bioethicist who uh, assisted us in that regard. The supplementary question. Uh, thanks, thanks, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You know, it's, it's, um, it's really the case that uh, the questions around people getting the vaccine who need them the first uh, is even much more confusing uh, because of the system that the government has put uh, back uh, put in place. It's a really confusing system. We have six regions that are going to go it alone and have their own registration. Then all of the other regions in Ontario are going to have their own registration. Uh, and they're going to be in part of the provincial registration, and then they're going to have hospitals registering, and then they're going to have pharmacies registering. How is it that people are going to be able to understand this? And maybe, maybe folks are going to put their names on every single list, Speaker. So the question remains, how do we make sure that people who need the vaccine the most are actually going to be able to get it first Order. when the process is such a confusing mess? Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the only person that's confused is the leader of the opposition. This is the way we have to deal with it. So what, what I'm hearing from the leader of the opposition is maybe we shouldn't have pharmacies, we shouldn't have the family positions, we shouldn't have mass vaccination centers. No, this is all hands on deck, Mr. Speaker. And the great news is someone in Ontario will receive the one million dose today. So it just goes to show you every, everyone's pitching in, and we're going to ramp that up. Uh, along with uh, AstraZeneca. The good news is, again, today at a shopper's drug mart, they're going to start pumping out the AstraZeneca and people will be getting needles in the arms. So I want to thank all the frontline uh, folks, no matter if it's the healthcare mobile units, paramedics, frontline healthcare workers, mass vaccination centers, all the PHUs doing an incredible job. Uh, they're, they're doing an incredible job. And once we get more vaccines, we're just going to ramp it up more. So thank you for the question. Final supplement. Well, in fact, Speaker, what we should have in Ontario is a plan instead of mass confusion and chaos that leaves that likely leaves vulnerable people behind when it comes to getting the vaccinations first. And that's the concern that we have. And in fact, we're not alone in that concern, Speaker. Dr. Warner says this. If we don't, and I quote, if we don't have a structure and we don't have a framework and we don't have true criteria that can be enforced and checked, people will jump the queue and the people who really need the vaccine will be forced to wait. People who need the vaccine most in this government's chaotic plan are going to not get it. They're going to be forced to have to wait. So the question is, how will this premier and his government make sure that people who need the vaccine the most will actually get it first? Premier. Through, through you, M Mr. Speaker, uh, another great news, zero mortalities in long-term care. You know, I, I could be quoting our, our doctors, too, as the leader of the opposition always uh, quotes us, Dr. Warren, Warner. Um, I'm sure he's a great doctor, by the way. Uh, but in, in saying that, uh, Mr. Speaker, 
We're already rolling out the 80 pluses, and hopefully very shortly, as we ramp this up, we're going to get through the 80 pluses. We're taking care of the most vulnerable people. And then I guess the leader of the opposition is questioning the ethics of the people of Ontario. I think that would be the worst thing in the world if a healthy young person tried to jump the queue and use the health condition uh, as, as getting it for getting a vaccine. The difference between the leader of the opposition and ourselves, we actually have faith in the people of Ontario. The people of Ontario got us through this pandemic. So we appreciate it. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the, uh, the Premier, uh, but I have to say I question the ex ethics of a government that let 4,000 people die in long-term care in the first and second wave of this, uh, of this uh, virus. But I do have to say, I mean, there are some positive things. Uh, there's no doubt about it. AstraZeneca is here. Uh, it's about to roll out. But the reality is everybody who needs a vaccine should be able to get it as easily as possible. And, of course, as folks know, last week, uh, we talked to the government and started asking the government, rather not last week, a couple of days ago, the beginning of this week, about whether or not they're prepared to step up and support those frontline heroes, those frontline workers who need to get vaccinated uh, but can't afford to lose pay. And we asked the government uh, to, um, to come forward and say to folks, if you need to get a vaccine, you need to have a, an appointment, you don't have to worry about losing a couple hours of pay. So the question is, uh, will the government Government do the right thing here and make sure those front frontline heroes Question. can do to, can easily get their vaccine uh, and protect not only themselves but the rest of us as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A tremendous amount, thousands and thousands of frontline healthcare workers have already received their vaccine. We actually encourage them more. My big concern is probably 40% may not get the vaccine, so we're encouraging them to, to come and uh, get it done. Uh, we, we have sites all over the province. We'll have the mobile units going into regions. We'll have the mass vaccination centers. We'll have the family docs uh, administering uh, the, the vaccine as well, and just to name a few. But talk about ethics, okay? Talk about ethics. As we were working our back off, the same party, the leader of the opposition, sent out a fundraising email to try to cash in on the tragedy of long-term care. Who does that? Who cashes in on the tragedy of long-term care? And the same political party, uh, the, the NDP, thought it would be appropriate to launch their campaign platform on the height of the second wave and using the second wave and the mortalities in long-term care to raise cash for their party. That's about as low as you can get, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. I think the Premier is a little confused and uncertain about the question I'm asking. I'm talking about frontline essential workers, folks that work in warehouses and, and in factories, folks that have been there bagging groceries and, and working in community, folks that literally can't afford to lose pay to go and get their vaccine. This is a matter of fairness, Speaker. It's a matter of fairness to make sure uh, that we do everything we can to help those workers uh, to be able to get uh, the time off that they need and not have to lose pay. So uh, it's something that is not only about fairness, but it also makes sense. In fact, New York uh, just passed legislation this week to give workers, all workers, uh, the time off with pay to go get their vaccine. Why is the Ford government turning their back on hardworking people, on frontline essential workers, on heroes, not only in terms of not giving them paid sick days, but not giving them the paid time off to go get their vaccines? Well, for, for the Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'll repeat what I said earlier on, that tens of thousands of frontline health care workers um, are getting their vaccinations. As a matter of fact, I talked to numerous CEOs of hospitals, and people are just getting them at the hospital. They're getting vaccinated right there, so they don't they don't have to take time off. But, Mr. Speaker, there's going to be vaccination centers open up right across this province seven days a week, in a wide in a wide range of different areas to make it very convenient for these healthcare heroes to get vaccinated, and even in long-term care. I know firsthand many. Many of them, probably the vast majority of the PSWs there, were in lineup at the, at the long-term care, and they were getting vaccinated. So I, I think, I, I truly believe, Leader of the Opposition is blowing this way, way out of proportion. Matter of fact, maybe she should do a little due diligence and find out how many actually are getting it at their, their place. Response. Thank you. And the final supplementary. 
Uh, speaker, maybe the Premier doesn't understand what an hourly waged worker has to go through to try to meet the bills. I mean, I think that's what's going on here. No concept. Speaker, I'm talking about essential frontline workers in all kinds of workplaces that were working while the rest of us were able uh, to stay safe at home. These are workers in places like Scarborough, Brampton, Etobicoke, Rexdale, all around the province. These workers were working and, are, and still are working uh, and need to be given the opportunity to take time off without losing pay to get their vaccine. It is a matter of what people deserve in terms of, uh, of our thanks, thankfulness for the work they've done. They deserve paid sick days, and they deserve to be able to get their vaccine and not lose pay. So will this Premier support this? I, I don't understand why he is so unwilling to support those essential frontline workers all around our Question. province who have been there for us in every workplace. Just give them the time off with pay to get their vaccine so the rest of so all of us can be safer and we can stop the spread. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. A again, rather than playing politics on the backs of our health care heroes, as the Leader of the Opposition did with our long-term care tragedy uh, throughout this province, these frontline health care heroes at the hospitals that I've talked to, and I've talked to dozens of them, more than dozens, they're getting it done at the hospitals. When I talk to long-term care, dozens, more than dozens, are getting it done right there at the long-term care. So we encourage the hospitals to continue, continue protecting their frontline health care heroes, no matter if it's a long-term care uh, or, or hospitals or any other area. We're going to continue doing it. I know our frontline first responders, they're getting taken care of as well. So we're, we're covering all the bases, but it's not about us, Mr. Speaker. It's about all the people pitching in, every single person, no matter how small, Response. how large it is. Everyone's pitched in Ontario, and we're doing so much better than the rest of the world and the rest of North America. We're going to continue on the path of uh, recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question uh, this morning is to the Premier. Speaker, there is a report that's breaking, uh, or broke rather, this morning on the CBC that shows that the ultimate reason the Premier is paving over wetlands in Pickering seems to be for a giant Amazon warehouse. The main developers, the triple group, are looking to cash in on skyrocketing property values if they get their way. And they're making sure that this Premier knows that they're real close, tight buddies uh, because they cut the party, the PC party, a check for $5,000 just a couple weeks ago. More than a coincidence, Speaker, if you're a big developer who needs an MZO right now, it seems that the world is your oyster. Yesterday, the Premier said he wants even more ministerial zoning orders. He will not put a stop to this. Uh, speaker, why is this government bending over backwards to build another warehouse on top of protected environmental wetlands? Mr. Speaker, I always stand behind the MZOs as all these other parties as they change the green belt 17 sure. times the NDP and the Liberals. Guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're expanding the green belt. We will not build on the green belt. We'll make sure we protect the, the green belt, unlike the NDP and the Liberals did for 15 years, taking care of their developer buddies. But let me let me tell you something, Mr. Speaker. What I'm, what I'm hearing uh, from the opposition Order. that the 1,000 affordable homes that we gave an MZO, we shouldn't do it. The MZO were giving and putting homes in Hamilton, the leader of the opposition. I should call the people that are going to be in those homes and say, guess what? The leader of the opposition doesn't want it. And as for the 26,000 new jobs through the MZO, and thank God Amazon's building and expanding here along with other companies uh, throughout Ontario. What should I do when we get through the recovery? Say, no, Order. let's go through the process that will take four years and everyone sit in the unemployment lands. And you know, Response. unemployment uh, line, I should say, that's what the NDP believe in. Socialism, socialism doesn't work. Freedom, democracy, entrepreneurship works. And it's- Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Order, the supplementary question. Speaker, uh, no one in this province should be left wondering whether projects are being sold for political donations uh, to developers. Okay. I, I feel the member has crossed the line. He's imputing motive. Must withdraw. I'll withdraw. Thank you very much. Speaker, if you're a worker desperate for paid sick days, 
There's no MZOs uh, and magic wands for you, and the Premier won't even take your calls. But it's pretty apparent that the Premier will move heaven and earth to get these folks what they want. This is about a company whose owners donated big political cash in order to make millions of dollars on land speculation. Why is this Premier? in the middle of this pandemic, so ready to do anything he can to build a warehouse for his donor buddies. Premier wants to reply. Mr. Speaker, I have to laugh when I, when I hear him speak because I don't even know who the heck the, the developer is, to be very frank with you. But as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I'm just reading Order. off my notes. The Order. developer, whoever this person is, actually donated to Stephen Del Duca's uh, you know, riding specifically to him, and also totaling over twenty thousand dollars worth of donations from the group since two thousand and fourteen, and, did, and did, including political donations. Never As I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, order. I'm reading off notes. Someone could give me a ton of money to Leader figure out who this is. Order. I don't have a clue who Ottawa this person is. But anyways, in saying that, Mr. Speaker, let's be very clear. This is about creating jobs. Yeah. It's not about donations. Maybe, maybe they could be bought. I can't be bought, neither can our party. That's the Premier to report. The next question. Member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, I know that the opposition fails to understand why you issue minister zoning orders. These are local priority projects that municipalities identify will play a key role in the province's recovery. Projects like affordable housing and long-term care beds. Members of this House need to better understand how involved and engaged municipalities are throughout the ministerial zoning order process. Will the minister speak to the typical process working with, working with, with municipalities that leads to an MZO. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Perth Wellington for highlighting this uh, very important topic. Uh, speaker, our government has been clear that every single minister zoning order issued on non provincially owned land has been at the request of the local municipality, full stop. Municipalities are in the driver's seat, not us. But of course, a municipal request simply starts the process for the government. We need to do our due diligence. For example, we've been clear that we are expanding the Greenbelt and will not develop any part of it. That's why I've rejected nine different MZO requests from municipalities that would have allowed development in the Greenbelt. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. The City of Stratford, which I'm proud to represent, made multiple requests for you to issue an MZO to allow a glass manufacturing plant. But following the concerns from residents, the company decided to suspend the proposal indefinitely. Then on Monday, the City of Stratford passed a council resolution asking for the minister to revoke the MZO. As a former municipal councillor myself, I have always encouraged local decision-making. I have always respected the role of our elected municipal councils, and I know you've been clear that municipalities are in the driver's seats. Given this new request, will you revoke the MZO in Stratford? Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thanks, Speaker. And again, I, I want to thank the member for Perth Wellington for the question. I also want to thank him for his, uh, his letter that I've received. Our government has been always clear that we are committed to working with our municipal partners to advance their local priorities. Uh, our government has been clear on that matter, and I want to reiterate that every single MZO issued on non-provincially owned lands has been at the request of the local municipality. Given that the City of Stratford no longer wishes to have the MZO in place to allow for the proposed development, I will be issuing the required 30-day public consultation notice to revoke this MZO. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It has been months since Ontario has received vaccinations. Brampton is one of the worst hit cities in this entire province by COVID-19. Yet the Premier has failed to give Bramptonians the details about when they're going to receive the life-saving COVID-19 vaccine. Frontline workers, 
seniors at risk communities don't know when or how they're going to be getting their vaccine. Now, Brampton has been a COVID-19 hotspot for months with no support from this Conservative government. The healthcare crisis at our single underfunded and overcrowded hospital was bad before COVID-19, and it's worse now. Despite the fact that there's a light at the end of the tunnel with the COVID-19 vaccine, Bramptonians are still being left in the dark. Why does this Premier think it's okay to leave frontline workers in the dark and refuse to give Bramptonians the details that they deserve to know about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I had a great conversation with the mayor of Brampton. He was thanking us for all the things we're doing for Brampton and opening up William Osler. They're already on, on their way and vaccinating people 80-plus, which they're doing a, a great job and, and throughout Brampton. And, and if you look at the numbers, we're really focusing and it's been very transparent on the hot spots. And, and Brampton was one of the hot spots. So it was Etobicoke North and so was Scarborough and so on and so forth. But we focused on uh, Brampton and they, if per capita, ended up with more vaccinations than a lot of regions. And a lot of regions are wondering why Brampton, why not me, so on and so forth, but it's a hot spot, so we focused on it. So I appreciate the mayor uh, reaching out and, and having a great chat, but you know something, Mr. Speaker, we have some great news coming to Brampton on a couple fronts. I just can't wait till the budget rolls out, and uh, I look forward to taking over the three other seats in Brampton in the next election. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Premier loves to pretend to care about frontline workers, but in cities like Brampton and others across Ontario, where workers, frontline workers are risking their lives every single day going to work, moving our economy, they've been given no details on when they're going to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. The people of Brampton and folks across Ontario, they've done their part. They have gone through the hardest months to stop the spread of COVID-19, and now they expect the Premier to do his job and prepare for this critical moment of the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. If this Premier actually cared about frontline workers, then he would immediately provide the details for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout now. Why is the Premier keeping communities that have been the hardest hit by COVID-19, like Brampton, in the dark about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout? Premier. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the, the question from the opposition. You know, we're, we're rolling it out big time in, in Brampton, and there's no, no secret. They're, they're getting more than anyone. Now, the good news is the family physicians in, in Brampton, they're going to get the AstraZeneca. So we have the mobile units in there. We have the mass vaccination centers. We have the PHUs going full steam. We have uh, the hospitals as well pitching in, and they're doing a great job out in the, the hospitals as, as well. So we're throwing everything in the kitchen sink uh, in the Brampton, and you're going to see the numbers start coming down. The people of Brampton are incredible. I lived there for five years. That's, that's where uh, I first moved when we got married. So I have a, a really close uh, spot in my heart for the people of Brampton. So thank you for the question. Question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Wetlands protect people, businesses, infrastructure, and property from flooding. They clean our drinking water. They keep the Great Lakes clean. And wetlands do all of this for free if we don't pave over them. Yet the government is ripping up environmental protections to destroy the Duffins Creek wetland. These extreme actions are for what, Speaker? An Amazon warehouse. An Amazon warehouse destroying wetlands for an Amazon warehouse, pulling out all the stops for an Amazon warehouse. So, Speaker, will the Premier prioritize the people over Amazon by revoking the MZO to destroy the Duffins Creek wetland. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, speaker, the, the MZO requested by the City of Pickering uh, and supported by the Region of Durham would help create over 10,000 jobs and boost the economy in that region. We are, as a government, supporting these local municipalities. The proposed change will ensure that priority projects that play a key role in the province's economic recovery, located outside of the Green Belt, do not face unnecessary barriers and delays after an MZO has been made. 
uh, the, this particular case that the member speaks about, the proponent and the TRCA have entered into an agreement that will ensure the creation of ecological benefits that will meet or exceed the loss of the natural environment system. This is a project that the region and the municipality have asked our government to provide, and we've extended an MZO for that purpose at their request. The supplementary question. Speaker, the city of Ajax, which is directly affected by this decision, has come out opposing this MZO. We have the TRCA, if you look at their report, says they've issued a permit under duress, and there is nothing that can be done to prevent or to fully prevent the damage that the government is doing with this MZO. And now think about what small business owners must be thinking about. You know, first the government kept big box stores open and allowed them to sell essential goods while small businesses were closed. Now their small businesses are having to compete with Amazon, and the government is pulling out all the stops for an Amazon warehouse. So, Speaker, I'm asking the government, will the minister, will the premier put the people Question. of Ontario first? Put small businesses first. Put the protection of our communities first by revoking the MZO that will allow the destruction of the Lower Duffins Creek wetland. Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. First of all, I'm not going to speak uh, ill of uh, a company that provides uh, hundreds and thousands of jobs in, in the province, uh, but I am going to go back to uh, the, the member's question regarding this site. The Ajax request uh, happened after the City of Pickering and the Region of Durham made the request uh, to the government for the MZO. I've talked about the proponent uh, for the site in Pickering, that he has an agreement with TRCA to provide the replacement uh, of, of, of wetlands. I, I also understand that, that since that time, uh, the Mayor and the Town of Ajax uh, have put a request in regarding their property and I understand that they were in strong opposition to the Durham Live site. Uh, I was sort of surprised to see it, uh, Speaker, given the fact that uh, Duffins Creek directly runs through the Annandale Golf Course, which is the subject of this. However, um, municipalities do make these requests and they, we are uh, obviously active in, under active consideration of any request that a municipality gives us. Thank you for the question. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, the parliamentary assistant to the minister represents Peterborough, and that's why I'm sure he was very happy to hear that our government is investing $695,000 to increase mental health and addiction services for students attending Trent University and Fleming College. This was excellent and welcome news, as we know that students at colleges and universities across Ontario have had their mental health negatively impacted by the COVID-19 outbreak. Even though the majority of students are not on campus, the government has a responsibility to make sure that our students are getting the support they need to succeed while attending college or university. Can the minister tell us what our government is doing to support mental health services on campuses and for students? The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Flamborough Granbrook for that important uh, question on mental health. She's right. COVID-19 has been a very challenging time for students across the province of Ontario, and that's why I was so proud to join the member for Peterborough Kawartha and the Minister of Infrastructure for a historic announcement of over 695,000 to increase mental health supports and services for those students attending Trent University and Fleming College. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned last week, this funding will be used to enhance important mental health supports for students like increased access to mental health practitioners, increased access to crisis counselling, mental health planning, additional FPHL counselling, international counselling, peer support, etc. This is critical support for our students at a time when they need it most. But, Mr. Speaker, our commitment goes beyond our post-secondary schools in Peterborough. Across the province, we've made a historic 26 
plus million dollar investment into mental health supports for students, and I'll expand more on that in the supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the parliamentary assistant for the update. We know that before the COVID-19 outbreak, students on college and university campuses were increasingly facing mental health challenges. According to the last National College Health Assessment Survey of the Canadian student population in 2019, 52% of students reported feeling depressed, and that compares to 46% in 2016. 69% experienced anxiety. 12% of Canada students had considered suicide compared to 14% in 2016, and 2.8% of students reported having attempted suicide. Speaker, those statistics are alarming and must change. I hear in my constituency all the time from students and family members about the need for greater on-campus supports. Speaker, what is the government doing to address these concerns across Ontario's post-secondary campuses? Member for and again, thank you to that member for this important question. As I mentioned, this government's made a historic investment of over $26.25 million in mental health supports for post-secondary students across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, that's a $10-plus million increase from last year at a vital time for students. This investment supports a number of new and ongoing initiatives, Mr. Speaker, and that includes mental health grants to publicly assisted colleges, universities, and Indigenous institutes. The Good to Talk mental health helpline for post-secondary students, new investments to support partnerships embedded in local communities to support student needs arising out of COVID-19, and a new virtual health mental health app. Mr. Speaker, this Premier recognizes the challenges students are facing. That's why we've stood up on this historic $26.25 million investment. We've expanded Spons? the virtual learning strategy to support students with a $50 million investment and a $164 million investment to expand capital supports for our colleges and universities. Thank you, the next question, the member for Hamilton West. And My question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, the Environmental Bill of Rights provides Ontarians with essential protections, yet this government has repeatedly and shamelessly violated this legislation. In fact, there's a letter from me on the Minister of the Environment's desk with these concerns. In late February, big developers dropped donations into PC party coffers, and just days later, Magically, this government tabled legislation and regulations to try to stop a lawsuit and pave over an environmentally sensitive wetland at Duffins Creek. Now there are concerns Schedule 3 of Bill 257 could violate the province's own Environmental Bill of Rights, especially because there was no consultation, particularly with Indigenous peoples. Why? Just days after taking big developer donations, is the Premier ploughing ahead with a plan that could violate Ontario's Environmental Bill of Rights? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, again, I, I want to correct uh, the record of the, the member opposite. Every uh, minister's zoning order that our government has done on non-provincial lands has been at the request of the local council. In fact, the Premier was absolutely correct uh, this morning. Uh, speaker, when he indicated that we did receive a request from the city of Hamilton uh, for an affordable housing project uh, in that community, I want to thank uh, MPP Skelly for making that announcement on uh, on my behalf. Um, I, again, Speaker, the the process uh, is simple. The municipality makes the request to the government, and the government considers it. it, it there is no other process, as the member opposite alludes to. Um, municipalities. Are in the driver's seat, Speaker. Yeah, I'll remind the House that you can't correct another member's record. You can correct your own. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for that uh, mansplaining or MZO splaining this morning. Order, order, order. I'm going to ask the member to take her seat. Order. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, you will know that Ontarians are outraged that the Premier is pushing everyone aside and plowing ahead with this development rather than protecting the natural wetlands. And now, this government is prepared to write law rewrite laws retroactively just days after receiving developer donations. Ontarians know that the Environmental Bill of Rights enshrines their rights to comment and be notified of proposals that impact the environment. Once again, it looks like this government broke our environmental laws 
Will the government do the right thing and pull back from this disastrous plan? Thank you, Speaker. Um, you know, again, our government has been crystal clear that uh, municipalities are the ones who make the request for the MZOs. Not, not a proponent for a particular development, but the local municipality. As well, uh, again, um, through you, Speaker, to the environment critic for the official opposition, I've denied nine requests from municipalities because the proposal included development of the Greenbelt. And I have been, uh, on behalf of our government, extremely clear that we will not accept uh, a proposal to develop in the Greenbelt. In fact, Speaker, we are involved. Uh, the op member opposite talks about consultation. We're involved in a historic consultation uh, on uh, growing the Greenbelt, which I hope, uh, based on input from Ontarians, that we will have the situation where we will grow the Greenbelt uh, to a level that we haven't seen since it was created in 2005. So we encourage Order. members from all sides of the House to participate in that uh, that uh, consultation opportunity. And again, Speaker, through you, I want to thank the member for the question. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, despite the claims of government members, things are not going well in Sudbury. Laurentian University with its extensive French language programming designated under the French Language Services Act is being restructured by Bay Street bankruptcy lawyers. And yes, Bay Street technocrats will determine the future of one of Northern Ontario's most important institutions. Worse yet, it is Bay Street that will decide the fate of the status of French in Northern Ontario. Laurentian University has long been designated under the Act, Mr. Speaker, and under the Act, the government has a legal obligation to provide the funds required for the Laurentian to comply with the French Language Services Act. Yet, I'm told that this government is still not meeting its obligation. My question is simple. Can the government confirm today in this House that we'll provide Laurentian University with the funding required to comply with the French Language Services Act? Merci. Thank you. The member for Northumberland, Peter Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for that question and for her concern. Mr. Speaker, I do find it deeply concerning that that member opposite is referring to our judicial system, uh, referencing Bay Street. We have a proud history in this province of an independent judicial system. This matter is before the courts. As I've said previously, Mr. Speaker, this government does find that. The, the reality at Laurentian University deeply concerning. We've been working to ensure that the students have access to the supports that they need, that there will be continuity of learning, Mr. Speaker. As this, member, as this matter is before the court, I will provide a little more in the supplementary, but it is inappropriate to comment any further as this matter, as I said, is before the courts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, quite frankly, that's not an acceptable uh, answer because it, it's not about the matter being before the court or not. It's about the government respecting the French Language Services Act. Um, that's separate. Um, of what's going on. So, Mr. President, on Mr. Speaker, we know that the government just uh, realized that the French Language Services Act exists, even if it's before my birth, but the government must respond to the question frankly. Mr. Speaker, in order to comply with this act, the government must provide Laurentian University with necessary funding to offer quality French language post-secondary programs in Northern Ontario. Will the government comply with the French Language Service Services Act, yes or no? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from that member and her party after decimating the post secondary sector, Mr. Speaker, after on the backs of students over a decade leading Order. to some of the highest tuition costs in the country, Mr. Order. Speaker. We put students first with a historic 10% reduction. Mr. Speaker, we've Order. invested more into Laurentian University with stable supports of over $80 million a year. We've invested in the North Northern Ontario Special Purposes Grant, $6.1 million per year. Graduate Expansion Grant, $7.9 million per year. We've stood to support Francophones across the province. In fact, it was this government that launched a university governed for and by Francophones in the province of Ontario. Order. So we'll take no lessons from that member opposite, who's now part of the Independent Party, on how to work with 
collaboratively with partners in the post-secondary sector. We will continue to support students in this province and ensure order. access to the jobs. Order. Thank you, Both sides of the House come to order. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week, members of this House debated a motion on the importance of the Line 5 pipeline. We discussed the impact of Line 5 on our province's economic future, energy security, and its importance to many sectors, including manufacturing and agriculture. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that Line 5 isn't just a pipeline. It's a lifeline, and one that supports thousands of people who work in well-paying, high-skilled jobs that help produce products we use every day. Most importantly, it is a, it is a supply that would be hard, very hard, if not impossible, to replace if the pipeline shutters in May. Will the minister inform this House about the government's efforts to ensure the continued safe operation of the Line 5 pipeline? Good question. Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Perth Wellington for his question, all of his dedicated work on behalf of his constituents. Mr. Speaker, we've had two important debates over the past two weeks, and I thank colleagues on this side of the House for taking a strong stand on this important issue from day one. I'm proud that our government is fighting to ensure the continued safe and responsible operation of Line 5. We know that as many as 30,000 jobs are at stake, and they're worth fighting for. I'm glad that the official opposition finally realized that it is appropriate to fight for families and jobs and joined us in supporting our motion on Line 5 that recognized pipelines as the safest way of transporting energy resources. All of us have a role to play in advocating for these jobs to stay in Ontario as we recover from this pandemic, Mr. Speaker, and I can assure the member that this government and this Premier will never stop fighting for those jobs. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Perth Wellington, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for reiterating the importance of Line 5 to our government. Important. I know that the minister has been a steadfast advocate since day one. Mr. Speaker, we know that the continued safe operation of Line 5 is not just important to Ontario, but to our whole country. I know that my colleagues and I have been writing to their federal counterparts to advocate on this important issue. Can the minister please tell this House what he's heard about the federal government's response to the Line 5 issue. Associate Minister of Energy to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as a member from Perth Wellington knows, our government has taken a Team Canada approach on this issue. We've been advocating nonstop for the continued safe, safe operation of Line 5 since November. As the member said, many of us have written to our federal colleagues. In addition to the Premier's advocacy, both the Minister of Energy, Mines and Indigenous Affairs and the Minister of Labour wrote to their counterparts in Ottawa to express concerns over the impact of Line 5 on working class, skilled trades jobs. And we were so relieved to hear the Federal Minister of Natural Resources recently state that the Line 5 pip pipeline is, and I quote, a vital part of Canadian energy security and its continued operation is non-negotiable in the context of our relationship with our neighbours and friends to the south. Our government is glad to hear this news and looks forward to learning more about what the federal government has been doing on the diplomatic front to resolve this issue. And be assured, Mr. Speaker, and the people of Ontario, we will continue to stand in unison and advocate with them to resolve this critical matter for the benefit of Ontario families. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Speaker. Uh, good morning. My question is to the Premier. Ontario pays uh, a lot of lip service to treaties. And Kiwet Nunga Yapmatung First Nation is part of Treaty No. 9, a treaty that Ontario signed. Ontario has a relationship with Yapmatung that they like to ignore until Ontario needs uh, EAs approved for roads and mining. Speaker, it's humane to let people live in tents in the middle of winter anywhere. But there are multiple families living in tents in Yamatuk right now, today. How can Ontario say it respects Treaty No. 9 when they do nothing to help Yamatuk? The Attorney General for response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member, uh, Cross, for the question. Uh, we, we are engaged with, with our First Nations and, and Treaty 9 uh, in particular on so many different files, whether it be uh, matters of, of vaccines, whether it be matters of justice, whether it be matters of services uh, across the board, Mr. Speaker. And is there more work to do? Absolutely, there's more work to do. And that's why we're engaged every single day with our, with our tremendous uh, Minister of Indigenous Affairs and, and our federal partners as well. 
Um, so we look forward to, to ongoing uh, ability to move things forward, and, and certainly it is something that we value, and we continue to want to work with them on every solution we can possibly find. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Uh, I'm not talking about programs and services and funding. I'm talking about treaties. This government has said that the treaty relationships are as relevant today as they were when the treaties were first signed. Speaker, uh, Ch Chief of Sekog Island uh, First Nation would disagree. The MZO issued last week to destroy the Duffins Creek wetlands impacts local Aboriginal and treaty rights. Chief uh, LaRocca stated that the local First Nations were not consulted or included in the decision-making process. Destroying this land and the water source sends a message. And the message is, there is no respect for First Nations treaty rights in Ontario. Speaker, why does Ontario not respect treaty rights? Yeah. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and, and again, I thank the member for his question and, and really his comment more than anything. The, uh, respecting treaty rights is something that the province is is doing and in so many fronts that we engage in fact we engage on on issues that are outside of treaty rights we engage on on issues that that affect communities ac across ontario uh, and and i'm not going to speak to to any particular uh, matter that the member is trying to advance just to say that we look forward to continued engagement and i think almost every member of our government has engaged with with the first nation on some issue uh, of, of relevance, and I can tell you, my department, uh, with the Indigenous Justice Division, is is really a shining example of the way governments can can work with and inform uh, internally in in the bureaucracy, as well as reaching out to the communities to make sure that their voices are heard. And we continue to look for opportunities to engage and and advance the interests of, of First Nations through respectful dialogue at every level. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Orléans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, Highway 413 is redundant and unnecessary. It would pave over farms, forests, wetlands, and portions of the Greenbelt and cost taxpayers billions. The government knows 413 would pave over 2,000 acres of Class 1 and 2 farmland, some of the most productive <clears throat> excuse me, in the province. They know 413 will impact the Credit River and Humber River watersheds that flow into Lake Ontario and, score, and are the source of drinking water for millions of residents Order. in the GTA. They know that 413 will cost Ontario taxpayers $6 billion or more and only save commuters uh, 30 seconds. We know these things, Mr. Speaker, in part because of the report commissioned by our leader and our Liberal Party, Stephen Del Duca, who led the way and shelved Highway 413, Order. Mr. Speaker. And so my question to the government is, will the government do the right thing and follow Stephen Del Duca's example and cancel Highway 413? Government side, come to order. Government House Leader to respond. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I don't even know where to begin on a question like that. First of all, let me just say this. Stephen Del Duca built an illegal pool on conservation lands, uh, and after being a minister for so long, apparently he did not know about it. This is the same minister, Stephen Del Duca, who decided to build a GO train station where nobody wanted it, where it wasn't supposed to go, against the advice of his officials. And the question is coming from a member who was in charge of a light rail system to build a light rail system that was over budget, that was late, and didn't work. I think the people of Ontario know they're well served by this party. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental is also for the Premier. The government's used the cover of the pandemic to trample local interests. They've trampled local democracy by unilaterally changing election laws. They've trampled local environmental knowledge and concerns by limiting conservation authorities. They've trampled local land use uh, and planning uh, policies uh, by using ministerial zone Side orders to, order. to exchange wetlands uh, for warehouses, Mr. Speaker. And more and more cities are now coming out opposing Highway 413. Order. They know spending billions of dollars 
uh, on a useless highway won't save any time, but it will take away from investments in public transit, Mr. Speaker. So my question, uh, with a $6 billion white elephant of a highway preparing to stampede across thousands of acres of farmland, hundreds of acres of sensitive greenbelt, will the government do the right thing? Will the government listen to local leaders and stop Highway 413? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think we've already addressed that on a number of occasions. We have to work, uh, of course, closely with our partners in the area. There is an environmental assessment uh, uh, to do, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the Green Party actually asked about this uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and as I said then, if it makes sense, we'll do it. If it doesn't, uh, uh, then we, we won't, Mr. Speaker. But uh, uh, look, when it comes to protecting Class 1 farmland, this member should know that it was actually Stephen Del Duca and his, go and his government went in office that evicted farmers from class one farmland in my riding. Generational farmers who had been there for years evicted kicking and screaming from their farms so that they could build an ecological park, Mr. Speaker, on class one farmland. It was that Liberal government, when we were trying to create the Rouge National Urban Park, the largest urban park in the country, and protect class one farmland, it was Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals who refused to transfer the lands into the Rouge National Urban Park because Plus. they wanted to evict farmers and reforest the area, Mr. Speaker. Stephen Del Duca is the worst thing for farmers. He's the worst thing for ethical government, and that's why the people who realize us Thank time you. to time Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough South West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Government House Leader, come to order. Constituents. Order. I apologize to the member for Scarborough South West. I'll give you extra time. Thank you, Speaker. Constituents in, in my riding have been writing to my office for weeks why their parents or grandparents cannot access vaccines, asking why Scarborough is being left behind, when vaccine registrations and pre-registrations for seniors over 80 and community health workers were open across the province, in many parts of the province, in Scarborough, people were left in the dark and had no option to book for a vaccine, because the portal in our region was not open yet. People are being told, were being told that the vaccine rollout actually took place, Pharmacies are open, Raxol is open, they ran out, portals closed, and then we're hearing from word of mouth that other places like Costco has it open last night, this morning they're closed, just all over confusion. People are deeply frustrated by the confusing nature of this government's vaccine rollout and, frankly, Speaker, the sheer incompetence of this government. So my question is, why is the plan what, what is the plan for the heart hit communities like Scarborough, and when can seniors in my riding and the rest of Scarborough, frankly, because they have four ridings uh, in, from, from the government side, can get vaccines? And why is this government turning a blind eye on my community of Scarborough Southwest and, frankly, all the ridings in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Pell. Thank you very much, Speaker. There is one plan for the vaccination of all of the people of Ontario. It is being distributed through 34 public health units in their own way because they know the geography, they know the, the people that live in their riding. They, so what happens in Toronto and the best way to do vaccinations is going to be different than in Thunder Bay or other parts of the province. However, I can advise the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that I visited a mass vaccination site in Scarborough the other day at Centennial College. It's working very, very well. They are able to process several thousand people there. It was quite busy, but it was moving very smoothly. People there don't seem to have a problem knowing where to go. They understand it very well. The system is working the way that it was intended to. question. Uh, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank all the healthcare workers, all the teams that are going out and vaccinating in Centennial that the minister is talking about. And, and it started this week. That is the unfortunate part, that it started this week when York, Appeal, other regions were getting it. Scarborough did not, despite being ground zero for this province when it came to COVID. Over 20% of all COVID-19 cases in this province are in Scarborough. And yet, the amount of vaccines that Scarborough has received is nowhere near equitable amount to that statistic. We have learned from Scar Scarborough Health Network that they currently have 10,000 dosage of vaccines, despite having the capacity to administer 35,000 of dosage. Scarborough Health Network has one of the highest COVID inpatient numbers for every 
100 COVID positive cases. Scott SHN will have five admitted to the hospital. And I'm once Question. again asking, how can this government look at the statistics, look at the reality, and still continue to overlook the critical need for an equitable vaccine distribution plan? Can this government commit to an equitable vaccine rollout strategy for communities like ours? Thank you. Nice to well, the short answer to that is yes. We do have one plan. We do have a plan that's rolling out. We are dependent on receiving vaccines from the federal government. There was a shortage of vaccines, as everyone will remember, in February. However, they are starting to come into in larger quantities now, and they are being equitably distributed across the province based on population and also based on those areas that are at higher risk. There are uh, a number of areas that are at higher risk where there are more hospitalizations, more uh, COVID cases, and unfortunately more deaths. Those areas will receive more, and we anticipate that Scarborough will share in that. But there is a, absolutely an equitable distribution. Scarborough is receiving its fair share, and we will receive more vaccine supplies coming in very shortly, which will allow us to uh, triple or quadruple the number of uh, vaccines that can be delivered to people every day. But Response. we still have to wait for receipt of those vaccines through the federal government. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, the, the Long-Term Care Commission uh, has shown Ontarians, given us a clearer picture about the decisions the government made when it came to building an iron ring around long-term care homes. Testimony from Dr. Allison McGear confirms that both the ministries of health and long-term care were presented with proposals allowing hospitals to support the long-term care sector by getting residents out of three- and four-bed ward rooms. The ministries decided not to proceed with this life-saving recommendation because it was deemed to be too expensive. Commission transcripts also re revealed that the Minister of Long-Term Care rejected calling in the military again because it would look like a failure. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain to families of residents Question. who've lost loved ones in long-term care why, if he was sparing no expense, were these proposals rejected? Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Thank you, Speaker. Those, uh, those accusations are preposterous. Uh, they are unfounded. Uh, they are um, they are wrong, and so uh, our government, no doubt, invested 1.38 billion dollars to shore up this sector during COVID. There is no doubt that every measure, every tool was used, and that no expense was spared. Dr. McGear herself said in testimony to the Long-Term Care Commission, "Quote: For me, a lot of this is second hand." Unquote. The suggestion that Ontario rejected proposals based on cost are completely inaccurate and misleading, and so is the comp. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. The member to withdraw her unparliamentary remark. Withdraw. Uh, yeah. be, it would be helpful if the member opposite were to provide the actual proposals to which he is referring uh, and to uh, and for everyone to see that those were costed proposals and uh, indicate how they how in fact how they were rejected thank you the supplementary question well perhaps in the supplementary the minister may want to explain why her treasury board submissions were rejected last february but Here's the reality, Speaker. The staffing challenge grew worse after the first wave. Ontario did almost nothing to address it. You know, by comparison, Quebec went out to hire 10,000 PSWs. They only got 7,000, but they paid them to train and they deployed them in October. What did Ontario do? $14 million to train and recruit PSWs, $42 million for security guards. And then the government announced a staffing strategy last week, eight months after Quebec did essentially the same thing. So I don't know how that announcement last week addressed what happened in the second wave. Maybe the minister could explain that because I don't know if they're going to do time travel, but I don't think that's going to protect or did protect families in long-term care. So why were these proposals rejected? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I like to deal with the facts, and the facts are that our government, through its pandemic pay, was able to recruit 8,600 uh, additional hires uh, to stabilize the sector. Eight 
6,600 and more. Uh, they no, you're, you are, the member opposite is confused. During the pandemic, pay, four hundred and sixty-one million dollars went to create eight thousand six hundred and thirty-six hires for long-term care. Order. And in addition to that, we have created an across-the-province program for PSWs. And I will also correct the member opposite. They were not PSWs through Quebec. Uh, they, were, they did not attain 10,000. They were people trained in three weeks and sent out into the field. You, the member opposite needs to get his facts correct. Response? No, you don't. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. <clears throat> Speaker, uh, when asked on Monday about the ministry memo that was warning of looming cuts to education funding, the minister assured us that funding was up and would continue. So it came as a real shock for parents and educators in Ottawa this morning who are waking up to news that the region's largest school board is expecting to cut at least 167 teachers this week fall. Speaker, students have faced a year of turmoil and are dealing with huge challenges in learning and in their overall well-being. Now is the time for us to be putting more caring adults in our schools, not less. How can the Premier justify a return to the kind of deep cuts he was making before this pandemic began? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I do note the changing position of the opposition parties. I mean, it was on February 5th where the member herself said, and I quote, the fact that they don't know where these hires occurred is deeply troubling. If they don't know where they, if they don't know, they shouldn't be, in a word that I cannot say in this House, uh, Ontarians with these numbers that they are coming up with. They're clearly not based in reality. That was February 5th, and yet today the member purports that these critical investments were central to the safety of schools and they ought not uh, relapse. You have to choose one or the other. You actually can't have the benefit of both ways. On this side of the House, we know from day one that we hired 3,400 more temporary teachers, 1,400 more custodians. We know that we hired hundreds of nurses, 623 to support our schools, as well as over 400 EAs. We also know, Speaker, that before this pandemic, our Premier invested more in public education than former Liberals did at the peak of their spending. And we know, as we look forward huh? to September, we will continue to invest more than we did the year prior for areas of mental health, for learning gaps, and to give young people the hope and the opportunity they deserve to reach their full potential in Ontario. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has a point of order. That he wishes. Thanks, Speaker. A point of order. I want to correct my record. Um, in response to a question by the member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas, uh, I should have indicated that the government has ERO posting 019-3233 regarding uh, the proposal she mentioned. Uh, it's posted from March 4th to April 3rd, and I have a copy that I'll ask a page to send her. Thank you. Well, again, the member can correct their own record, not rebut something that was said in question period, but we have a point of order after question period. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Guelph has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing concerning revoking the MZO on the Duffins Creek wetland. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell has given notice of his dis her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Colleges and Universities concerning the French Language Services Act and Laurentian University. And this matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Now we have a deferred vote on the private member's notice of motion number 145 in the name of Ms. Stiles. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their ballots, their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies. <laughs>